Okay, so we have just put uh, uh, on the course website uh, hints for your assignment number one. So if you want, the main purpose of the assignments is not this 20% mark that uh, you get by doing them, but uh, to practice problem solving, Uh, and uh, to prepare yourself for the midterm and the final that are together 80% of your mark. So I urge you as soon as uh, we release uh, an assignment to try to do it completely on your own and try really hard, uh, even if this might be frustrating, okay? Then, um, after a week of trying, uh, if you have some problems that you couldn't crack, you will always get, after a week, uh, a set of hints for your assignment that will give you, uh, please, if you can be more quiet, otherwise I'll send you to Siberia. <laughs> okay, for an extended winter vacation. So, <clears throat> Um, so after you get the hints, then you give it another shot, right? Uh, and if it's still hard, you come to my office hours or you consult with your colleagues. It's okay to talk about the problems, but it's not okay just to copy someone's solution because the system will catch plagiarism. You have to describe in your own words uh, uh, the solution, right? And if you can do it in rhyme, you get extra credit. So, um, that was the first thing I wanted to tell you. Okay, so um, please practice problem solving because with every attempt, regardless whether you succeed or fail, you get better. So let's very briefly review the, what discrete Fourier transform is. And as I mentioned, <coughs> That's something totally trivial to how to remember it uh, without memorizing any formulas. If you have a sequence of n numbers, a0, a1, up to a n minus 1, that can be either real or complex numbers, right? Uh, discrete Fourier transform is defined also for complex numbers. What you do is uh, you simply form a polynomial whose coefficients are the elements of your sequence. So nothing to remember there, just uh, um, form a polynomial a0 plus a1x plus a2x squared all the way plus a n minus 1 to the power, uh, times x to the power n minus 1. Right? And then you simply evaluate this polynomial at all roots of order equal to the length of the sequence, in this case n. So you will simply substitute x with omega n to power k, where k ranges between 0 and n minus 1. <coughs> Excuse me. So discrete Fourier transform is nothing but the sequence of values of the polynomial constructed from the elements of your sequence as uh, coefficients evaluated at all the roots of unity of uh, order equal to the length of the sequence. Right? So this sequence of values so this is omega n to the power zero. This is omega n, omega n squared, all the way up to omega n to, power, to the power n minus one. This sequence is called the discrete Fourier transform of the original sequence A. So nothing to remember. A sequence form a polynomial with coefficients that are elements of the sequence and evaluate it at all the roots of unity of uh, 
the order equal to the length of the sequence. Okay, so let's see now uh, how to use um, discrete Fourier transform for fast multiplication of polynomials. This is our strategy. The main skeleton of the strategy is identical to the one that we used in the Karatsuba method, right? So if you have two polynomials, PA of X and PB of X, of degree at most N, the product will be of degree at most 2N. So the product will have 2N plus 1 coefficients. And you evaluate these two polynomials at the roots of unity of order 2n plus 1. To start later, we will slightly alter that. So the only difference between the Karatsuba, generalized Karatsuba, and this method is that instead of evaluating the polynomials from minus n at integers from minus n to n, we evaluate them at the roots of unity of order to n plus 1. Why do we do that? For two reasons. First, remember, the polynomials are of degree n, so if you substitute n as x, you will have value n to the n, which, can be, which is gigantic even for relatively small n, like 10, right? Um, so that's one reason. Uh, as we saw, roots of unities, or roots of unity taken to any power remain on the circle. They just spin around the circle, but their size doesn't grow at all. Right? Um, the other reason why we use roots of unity is the disevaluation of the two polynomials can be done extremely fast in time and log n, as we will see. So now notice um, we define the discrete Fourier transform as the value of a polynomial with n coefficients at all roots of unity of order n. But here, we want to evaluate the two polynomials at 2n plus 1 roots of unity of order 2n plus 1, right? So if you just evaluate PA of x at these roots of unity, that wouldn't be quite the discrete Fourier transform because you are evaluating at more, uh, at different roots of unity and in larger number of roots of unity. To keep our story kind of coherent, uh, we do the following trick. You pad this sequence with n zeros, right? So the corresponding polynomial will have zero times x to the n uh, plus zero times x to the n plus one all the way times zero times um, x to the n. Uh, sorry, x to the two n. So this padding, now, of course, this polynomial is exactly the same as the polynomial without these silly zeros. But now, uh, evaluating this polynomial at roots of unity of order 2n plus 1 will be precisely the discrete Fourier transform, because here you have, in fact, 2n plus 1 many coefficients, except that the last n are all zeros. Okay. So we will then multiply the corresponding values uh, just like what we did in Karatsuba. We multiplied in Karatsuba p at n with q at n, or whatever, a, uh, p a at n and uh, uh, p b at n. Here, of course, the, we are using different values, right? So. Um, but the idea is the same. We simply evaluate these values point by point, right? And because there are only 2n plus 1 many values, you will do only 2n plus 1 many multiplications, uh, just like in Karatsuba. Then we use the inverse transformation for, uh, for the discrete Fourier transform called the inverse discrete Fourier transform 
to recover the coefficients of the product polynomial from its values at these roots of unity, right? So you have a polynomial in coefficient form and another polynomial of, in the coefficient form, but that's hard to multiply because you would need to do n squared many multiplications, each coefficient by, of the first by each coefficient of the second. Instead, you evaluate these two polynomials at sufficient number of points, 2n plus 1, which happen to be just the roots of unity. You multiply them value by value, all these 2n plus 1 many values, and you get 2n plus 1 many values of the product polynomial. <clears throat> and then you just use inverse discrete Fourier transform to find the coefficients of the polynomial given, of the product polynomial given its uh, 2n plus 1 many values. Okay, so this is the strategy. <clears throat> you pad the polynomial, you find its discrete Fourier transform, which is just this. You pad the other polynomial, find the di discrete Fourier transform of that uh, polynomial, right? Then you multiply them point by point, PA at 1 times PB at 1, just like in Karatsuba. All the way, right, at all these 2n plus 1 many values, so you have 2n plus 1 many multiplications. And then you find inverse Fourier transform to recover the coefficient C given its values, because these are PC of omega 2n plus 1, this is PC at 1, and so forth. So that's the strategy, to go back and forth between the coefficient representation of a polynomial and value representation of a polynomial. So multiplying uh, 2n plus 1 many values is obviously done in linear time, so we have to find an efficient way to compute the discrete Fourier transform and inverse discrete Fourier transform. What does this mean? We have to find uh, for each fixed k between 0 and 2n, we have to compute uh, these uh, uh, values, right? So now, um, notice here these powers do not involve any multiplication, any multiplications because n is the degree of the polynomial. Uh, these roots of unity do not depend on the, co on the coefficients, a's and b's, but only on the degree. So you can pre-compute them and store them in memory f in a table and use them for any two polynomials that are of the size n, right? Uh, degree n minus 1. However, what costs a lot is multiplying the coefficients with these powers of the roots of unity. Each of these multiplications, right, has to be done. The, uh, it will be, even if b's are integers, uh, this will be a floating point uh, multiplication with a complex number, right? It will have, each root of unity has its real and its imaginary part. So, in principle, you will have uh, all of n squared many multiplications because you have n coefficients and you have also uh, 2n plus 1 many uh, values to evaluate. So we won't do this by brute force, and how do we do it faster? This is precisely what the fast Fourier transform does. So fast Fourier transform is not a transform in its, its own right. It's an algorithm that computes the discrete Fourier transform. Discrete Fourier, the discrete Fourier transform is, a, is a, a transform because it takes one sequence and produces another sequence, right? The sequence of values of your polynomial. But fast Fourier transform is just an algorithm that instead of using n squared many multiplications, computes uh, the discrete Fourier transform in n log n times. And that's crucial improvement 
in the early days when you used modems to connect uh, um, uh, to a remote computer, uh, your modem uses uh, uh, the fast Fourier transform to do that. And uh, these good old days, uh, if it was an n squared multiplication, it would be prohibitively slow for the purpose of communicating. So fast Fourier transform really enabled fast uh, um, computation. And to present day, it is used uh, to do signal processing in a very efficient way. Yeah. OK, so what is the main idea of the fast Fourier transform? Actually, the algorithm is remarkably simple. And it's uh, one of the most beautiful examples of divide and conquer. And this is the main topic of these few algorithms that we will present. So we are studying divide and conquer uh, algorithms uh, to see how uh, widely applicable they are and to master the technique. So this is our polynomial. And we can assume that n is a power of 2. Otherwise, again, we use the same trick. We pad the coefficients of this polynomial, adding 0 times x to the n uh, plus 0 times x to the n plus 1 until you hit a perfect power of 2. Now, if I give you a number k, what is an, uh, how large can the nearest uh, larger power of 2 be? If you have a number k, say 17, you are guaranteed to have power of 2 smaller than what number? How would you find the nearest power of 2? The k number hmm? is smaller than this k. So, k minus 1. So, k is the original number. How big can be the first larger power of 2? If you represent your, yes, you wanted to, sorry? Log base 2k is the number of digits. <laughs> OK, so let's think in binary. Let's think in binary. Imagine the representation of a number k. So it has log 2 many zeros and ones. How would you? find in binary the smallest power of 2 that is larger than this number from its binary representation. What do you do? Exactly. Just put 1 right on the left, right, and then set all other digits to 0. But how big is this number compared to the a starting number, it is smaller than, how do you get the least number with one digit more? Um, can it be larger than 2k? No, 2k already has one digit more. So you are guaranteed that the, the, you will not increase the length of the polynomial um, more than by a factor, actually strictly less than by a factor of two. And uh, as we will see, this is, this is uh, tolerable because of the presence of the log, right? So, um, so how do we evaluate fast our polynomial? Idea is very simple. You simply split the polynomial into all even degrees plus all odd degrees, right? Then what you do, you can, because all the degrees here are even, you can pull out one, two, and get these numbers instead of four, you get x squared squared and so forth. From the second odd part, you can pull out one x, and you again get a polynomial that contains only even powers. So now what you can do, 
you can consider the following two polynomials. So you simply replace x squared by y, right? In this polynomial that contains all the even coefficients and also in this polynomial that contains only odd coefficients because we pulled out one x out. So you get these two polynomials and these two polynomials are of the half degree only, right? Um, approximately, right? Because uh, if the sequence is of uh, land 2 to the k, the degree of the polynomial is 2 to the k minus 1. And here you will get the degree n over 2 minus, uh, minus 1, right? So what have we done? Uh, so then the original polynomial can be obtained from these two polynomials by substituting back y with x squared. Uh, in this form, right? So we have reduced evaluation of a polynomial with two to the k many coefficients to evaluation of two polynomials with two to the k minus one many coefficients, half many coefficients, right? So these two polynomials, a0y and a y, a1y, are of approximately half degree. They have exactly half as many coefficients as the original polynomial. Okay. Uh, so now, but notice we are still not done if we want to use divide and conquer. We have to reduce a problem of size n in say, two problems of size n over two. Well, what is a problem of size n? It's evaluate a polynomial of degree n minus one or with n coefficients at n many roots of unity. So the problem of size n over two will be evaluate a polynomial of degree n over two minus one, i.e. with the n over two many coefficients at only at n over two roots of unity, right? And so this is why we are not done because here it is true that these uh, polynomials a0y and a1y are of half the degree, but we still have to evaluate them at all numbers that are of the form x squared when x ranges over n many roots of unity. But now that's where our cancellation lemma kicks in. If x ranges over n many roots of unity, then x squared ranges over how many uh, roots of unity only? Exactly, so if uh, x ranges over n many roots of unity, the squares range only over n over too many roots of unity. Because remember, uh, cancellation lemma says that squaring, right, uh, squaring doubles each angle. So all the roots of unity with odd many initial arguments will be gone, right? Only even multiples remain. So in this way, not only did the two polynomials have half of the degree, but they themselves have to be evaluated at only half many values, right? Uh, because remember, just let me give you an example. Say, let's consider eight many, so roots of unity of order n, right? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 
What is the square of 1? 1. So this guy stays. What is the square of this guy, which is omega 8? It is this guy because I have to double. So this will be omega 8 squared, which is just omega 4. So this, I get this number, I got this number. Now next guy is this one. When I square it, which number do I get? Hmm? What happens if I double the argument of this guy? Well, this is 90 degrees and 90, it's 180 degrees. Here it is. Uh, what happens uh, with uh, this guy if I, if I square it? Uh, well, the argument uh, has to double and I will get uh, uh, this guy here. And if you now square this one, you get back here. So starting with eight values, I got only four distinct squares, right? Because omega 8 to any even power 2k is just omega 4 to the k, and I can have only four distinct values, right? So by splitting our polynomial, right, and ensuring into even and odd powers, and by considering the polynomial with even powers, uh, by substituting x squared with y, we cut the degree into half. But the arguments y, because y is equal to x squared, will no longer range over n values, but the arguments will range only over n over too many values. Right? So, um, how do we then compute PA at omega n to the k? Well, we compute the value of this polynomial. We compute the value of the other polynomial A1. We have to multiply with omega n to the k and we add them up. But omega n k squared is just omega k n over 2. So this is a polynomial of degree or with n, many, n over 2 many coefficients evaluated only at n over 2 distinct values because even though k goes all the way up to n, it will make two complete revolutions, so you will actually get only n over 2 many values. Now here we are still stuck with omega n to the k, so we will need n many multiplications. So, we have two sub-problems of length n over 2 plus linear n many multiplications here, so linear overhead. So, the total number of multiplications uh, will be... Um, so the uh, total, so uh, the, our algorithm uh, will satisfy t of n equals two times t of n over two plus constant times n to account for these multiplications. But let's uh, uh, first clean up a little bit uh, this calculation because you can sim simplify it a little bit more. So by um, the cancellation lemma, omega n to the power n over 2 is omega 2 times n over 2 to the power n over 2. And the cancellation lemma tells us that n over 2 in the exponent and n over 2 in the base can cancel out. So we get omega 2. And what is omega 2? That's a root of unity of order 2. What are the only two roots of unity of order 2? One is one, and the other is minus one, right? So the uh, primitive root of unity is minus one, and so this is what we get. If k, if the exponent is larger than n over two, right? So 
we know that uh, the idea is now this. We want to let k range only up to n over 2, right? To make the computation a little bit more efficient. So if uh, the exponent is larger than n over 2, it can be written as n over 2 plus some k, right? But this we can write, we can separate this as a product of the two omega n to the power n over 2 times omega n to the k. Omega n to the n over 2 is just omega 2, as we saw. And we get that this is just minus omega n to the k. So, um, essentially, uh, this guy will be mapped into precisely the opposite guy on the unit circle. So now we can simplify this evaluation for k larger than n over 2 as follows. Uh, right? This looks messy, but nothing terribly important is happening. So let's just see. So if you substitute in the first polynomial omega n to the power n over 2 plus some m, squared, then you have the same omega here, and squared that value as the input of the second polynomial. If you uh, multiply by 2, you get this. Right here, you will get uh, omega n to the power n over 2 times omega n to the m. Here, when you multiply, you get this, right? So now you can pull out, this is just a long way of writing a trivial thing. You see omega n to the n. What is omega n to the power n? One, One because omega n is the root of unity of order n. So this disappears because it's equal to 1. This omega 2 to the power, sorry, omega 2 times n over 2 to power n over 2, as we saw, is just m minus 1. So you get this. And here, of course, this is again 1, and you just get omega n to the power m squared. So notice now, if you compare this uh, with evaluation when m is smaller than n over 2, if uh, your number is larger than n over 2, then you get exactly the same answer with, as you would get with m less than n over 2, except that this plus has become minus, right? So this will uh, save you n over 2 many multiplications, because instead of multiplying with this guy, you will just multiply with minus omega n to the power m. So uh, what did we... Uh, get. Here is the, the pseudocode for our FFT algorithm, and look how simple it is. It's a divide and conquer algorithm. Let's call function FFT of a sequence A. So A is A0, A1, A2, up to AN minus 1, right? So of course, if the sequence is of length n equals to 1, then you just return A. Nothing happens. Now, otherwise, uh, as we mentioned, you split the sequence into all even coefficients that correspond to even powers of your polynomial and the sequence of all odd coefficients, right? Then you recursively apply the very same function to the sequence A0 and to the sequence A1. What will, do, what will this do in effect? It will produce all the values of these two polynomials, A0 and A1, at the roots of unity of order n over 2. And now all what it is left is to combine them. Remember, each value here, we have to add this value multiplied by the corresponding uh, power of the root of unity. So here it is, uh, uh, your primitive root of unity is just e to the i times 2 pi over n. And you start with its uh, zero power, zero power of omega n 
is just one. Uh, and then for k equals from zero, only up to n minus two minus one, because of this trick that we don't have to go, we, it's enough to go only through n over too many values. You combine, uh, you obtain the element omega k and simultaneously element omega n over 2 plus k, or better to say k plus n over 2, simply from the corresponding value of the first polynomial and the second polynomial multiplied by the k uh, power of uh, the omega, because in, uh, uh, after we do the multiplications, and the summation and addition, we increase the power that is uh, in of, uh, of omega n that is encoded by omega by multiplying with, with an extra power of omega n. So in the next round, uh, after in k plus first round, this will be of the corresponding power k plus 1 and k plus 1. And then you just return y. And you can see this is divide and conquer with very tight loops. And it is extraordinarily efficient, not only as we will see in a moment that it runs in times n log n, but the coefficients are also very small. So it's an exceedingly fast algorithm. And that's one of the reasons why it is so wildly used in uh, say in MP3 and JPEG. Um, so, so let's see how fast the Fourier, uh, the fast Furious transform is. Uh, so we have recursively reduced the evaluation of a polynomial PA of degree n minus one. Uh, at n roots of unity of order n to evaluating two polynomials, each of degree n, minus, n divided by 2 minus 1, at only n over too many roots of unity of order n, plus the overhead of combining. So let's see what we have. We will have that um, the total work to find fast Fourier transform of a sequence of size n has been reduced to two, uh, to two sub problems of size n over 2, namely evaluating a polynomial with n over too many coefficients in n over too many uh, roots of unity, plus this multiplication. Uh, but uh, uh, remember here, um, here we cannot say we really have to do uh, element by element multiplication, right? So this is a linear overhead. So here it is, t of n will be twice t of half size problem plus c times n where, uh, where we account for multiplication with omega n to the power k. Uh, when k goes from 0 to n over 2 only. Okay, and the master theorem immediately gives us, just as in case of the merge sort, that uh, this uh, uh, algorithm runs in time theta of n log n. Okay, so... After we finish a little bit more about the Fourier transform, we will start doing divide and conquer algorithms, greedy uh, technique, dynamic programming, and we will totally change the format of the class. We will have on the slides only the statements of the problem, and then we will together develop algorithms on the blackboard. Right, you will suggest an algorithm and then we will massage it in a correct solution because that's the only way to learn the skill of designing algorithm. If I showed you slides, it's just, you know, formulas flashing in front of your eyes and 
nothing good about that. So uh, we will interactively um, design algorithms so that you pick up the tricks and the techniques. So please bear a little bit longer. This is the end of math. Uh, uh, let us just quickly finish it. Uh, okay, maybe it's a, uh, is it good time to make a break now? Okay, let's make, uh, it's a good point to stop. So let's make a short break of five minutes only. I've had a couple of questions. In the uh, question where you have to make...